In this video, I want to talk about a very early 20th century particle accelerator called the cathode ray tube. And this is a piece of apparatus that J.J. Thompson worked with in order to discover the electron. So the electron was the first subatomic particle discovered. And it was J.J. Thompson in 1897 who suggested that there was in fact a more fundamental particle than atomic hydrogen, which was thought to be the most fundamental particle around about that time. And that this particle that was proposed by J.J. Thompson was about 1,000 times lighter than atomic hydrogen. And so he's credited with discovery of the electron, and he got a Nobel Prize um, in 1906 for his work on conduction of electricity in gases. And in fact, that is what cathode ray tubes really are all about, conducting electricity through gases, as we'll see in a moment. So we'll look in this video at how to measure the charge to mass ratio of these subatomic particles called electrons. And just quickly, as a historical note, J.J. Thompson's son was George Paget Thompson, who received the Nobel Prize in 1937 for electron diffraction. And so that was following on from a postulate by Louis de Broglie. So that's a very interesting story in quantum mechanics available in other videos. For now then, we're going to focus on the cathode ray tube, a very early particle accelerator. What we have then is a piece of glassware and uh, we have two electrodes with a high voltage placed between them. We have a negatively charged cathode, a positively charged anode, and this glass, uh, this vacuum tube, is nearly evacuated of all air, but there's still some air left in there, which is actually quite important for the experiment to work. And what happens is, with the application of this high voltage, we get this so-called cathode ray. It's called a cathode ray because it emanates from the cathode, from the negative electrode. And that will result in a, in a dot being seen on a fluorescent screen on one side of this piece of glass. But in fact, the cathode ray itself does often look green, and that's due to the ionization of residual oxygen present inside the tube. And when the oxygen is excited, um, by the ionization, it de-excites with emission of green light. Okay, so the residual gas atoms in that vacuum tube are ionized uh, by the electrodes here, the high voltage between the electrodes, and so some of those positively charged ions will bombard the cathode and we get emission of these particles that J.J. Thompson was trying to look at. So let's just see um, how to understand what those particles are like and look at the maths of what is going on. First of all, then, if we've got a cathode and an anode, we have an electric field. Um, here I'm calling that E1. And uh, we're dealing with, if we use the model of charged particles, which is in fact the model that explains cathode rays, we'll just say that they have some charge Q. Later on, we now know that to be the charge of an electron, which is often denoted as lowercase e. But for now, a charge Q multiplied by the electric field E1 um, gives us the amount of force applied to those particles of charge Q being emitted from the cathode. So that's just a standard equation of electromagnetism. And we know that the electric field is just the voltage divided by the distance. The electric field is volts per meter. So what we'll do to start off with is look at considering the potential energy of the, the particles emitted from that cathode. So if they have some charge Q, and, and it's observed that they're drawn towards the anode, so we do know that Q is a negative charge, but let's look at their potential energy because they're going to be accelerated by this electric field between the cathode and the anode. So they're going to undergo an acceleration and because of that acceleration, we can say at the cathode level there, they have potential energy. So that's going to be basically a force times the distance over which that force acts. And so basically, we end up with a very simple uh, result of force times distance, and we end up with just the expression of the charge times the potential difference, the voltage between the two electrodes. So the potential energy of these particles emitted from the cathode is just QV1, or indeed EV1, if we uh, go ahead and use the charge of the electron at this stage. Of course, here, Thomson was trying to figure out what these cathode rays were, and so we could just 
work with some unknown charge Q. Okay, and so all of that potential energy is converted to kinetic energy by the time it reaches uh, the anode. So we take that potential energy QV1 and equate it to the kinetic energy, and that will say that the velocity of these charged particles when they reach the anode, and you'll notice there's a small uh, hole there for the um, charged particles to escape from the anode, the, the velocity of those particles at that point is just given by rearranging this, this equality between kinetic energy and potential energy. So just by solving this for V, we can see that V is just a 2V1 uh, multiplied by Q divided by M and uh, square root of that will give us V. Now the observation was, in fact, it didn't matter what kind of metal to within reason was used for that cathode, the same cathode rays uh, with the same properties were obtained and that also therefore suggested these to be um, the electrons that were discovered suggested them to be fundamental uh, particles. So let's look at the next stage then in the experiment. So having um, got these cathode rays, um, these electrons as it turned out, uh, to be accelerated here and to impact on a screen, what can be done to investigate the properties of these particles is to apply a second electric field. We had one electric field here. We can apply a second electric field here to deflect uh, these particles. And in fact, the fact that they did deflect revealed the type of charge that they had and also revealed that they had mass as well. So if we, if we put in the field lines for an electric field E2, then we, gain, we, we, get, we again get electric field lines going from the positive to the negative. So here before we had the field lines from the anode to the cathode here, we've got another anode and another cathode here, and so another set of electric field lines. And that's why I'm calling it E2 to distinguish it from the first electric field. And um, what we notice is that the um, cathode ray um, is deflected upwards towards the positive anode, again confirming these as negatively charged particles. So the deflection behaviour in indicates the cathode ray consists of negatively charged particles. So here is a, a simple kind of animation of that process of the fact that we can actually uh, modify the polarity, the positive negative charges of the anode and the cathode, or rather those two electrodes. And according to the polarity, so if the positive charge is there, um, then the, the deflection is upward for the positive charge, and when the negative charge is there, then the positive charge is here and the deflection is downward. So we can also uh, deflect the beam by using a magnetic field. And so here now we have, um, this is a representation of a magnet. In fact, Helmholtz coils could be used for the magnetic field to be able to control the strength of that field, which is quite important um, in order to modify the deflection of the beam. But if we just represent an, uh, a magnetic field with a north-south pole here, then that also serves to deflect the beam. And if we use this well-known uh, equation for the force acting on a charged particle when moving with velocity v through a magnetic field b, um, then we in fact observe uh, that kind of behavior for this beam of charged particles. So there is um, the right-hand rule which helps us to understand the direction of movement of these charged particles. This is called the right-hand rule. And so what we can do is use uh, our right hand and uh, this finger here to point in the direction of the velocity of the particles, the second finger to point in the direction of the magnetic field, and then the force direction is given by the thumb as indicated here upwards. So if we apply this right hand rule to this configuration for a positively charged particle, we'd expect an upward movement, but we observe a negative, um, rather we observe a downward movement of the cathode ray, indicating again that the charge is negative. And also you might look at Fleming's left hand rule as well as a way of understanding this, just remembering though that current is in the conventional direction of flowing from a, um, in terms of direction of flow of a positive charge. So bear that in mind if you do pause the video to check that uh, alternative understanding. Okay, so again, the deflection behavior is consistent with negatively charged particles. Uh, so we can focus now on just the magnitude of that force arising from the magnetic field B applied to particles of velocity V. 
So this is a, a little video of what happens with a bar magnet showing indeed that these cathode rays can be deflected by a magnetic field. So now the crucial part of the experiment is to delicately balance the B field, the magnetic field, with the electric field by having them on at the same time. And they're switched on in such a way, because we can control both of them with um, the amount of current that we put in. Um, so we can control the, um, the mag magnetic field according to the current that we put in, and we can also control the voltage um, for the second electric field as well. So we can, we can basically uh, balance the deflection of this cathode ray because the magnetic field will bend it downwards and the other electric field, E2, will push it upwards. So what we can do then is equate um, these two forces by manipulating B and manipulating E, the strength of the magnetic and the strength of the electric field, such that there is no net force. And when there's no net force, that beam will now carry on in a straight line. And then we know that this force balance equation is holding. And that gives us an independent way of measuring the velocity of particles passing along that region in the vacuum tube. So let's take a closer look then. This is one of the charged particles in that cathode ray. We know from our earlier calculation, the velocity of that is just given by the square root of two times the accelerating potential V1 multiplied by the charge to mass ratio of these charged particles. Um, the electric field and the B field are, will also be acting on that particle, the B field to drive it downward, the E field to drive it upward. If we balance those two, then we get this equality. We can rearrange that and see that for velocity to just be unchanged as it goes through that part of the vacuum tube, the velocity must be the ratio between the electric field and the magnetic field. So we can equate this with our first expression. So if, if V is E over B, then V squared is E squared over B squared, and V squared is just 2V1 um, times Q over M. So that's the expression here. That allows us directly to solve in a very simple way for the charge to mass ratio Q over M is just 1 over 2V1 E squared over B squared. And so that is the charge to mass ratio of these charged particles, which indeed explains the behavior of these cathode rays perfectly, showing that they are particles with a certain charge and a certain mass. But it turns out here that that ratio is absolutely colossal if considered in standard SI units of coulombs and kilograms. Um, and so we'll see the value in a moment, but just to point out that, of course, we know now these particles are in fact electrons, and so often the charge Q is written as the fundamental unit of electric charge um, E, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So in summary, and I'll give you the value for charge to mass ratio in a second, in summary, cathode rays must be made of particles that are negatively charged based on the way that they moved with electric and B fields. And also the cathode rays have identical properties, whatever the type of metal we use for that initial uh, cathode, where those rays emanate from. Um, the results also didn't type, depend on the type of gas in the vacuum tube. Um, and furthermore then, this led really to the understanding of these to be subatomic particles because they were common whatever the material. And if you do do the calculation of E over M, oh, sorry, just to say that Thompson therefore proposed this rather naive model of the atom, which was surpassed by the Rutherford model, uh, where you have this kind of uh, bed of positive charge with uh, the negatively charged electrons embedded within it, the so-called plum pudding or blueberry muffin model, whatever you prefer. Um, but that was surpassed later on, as, as you'll find out in later atomic physics videos. But just to say, that Thomson put together this model to understand how these subatomic particles fitted in to the atomic picture. Okay, um, so now then finally to quote uh, the charge to mass ratio for the charged particles in the cathode rays, which are in fact electrons, and you get this colossal value of about 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram, which is truly a huge number based on these units. Thank you very much for listening.